today on Ask This Old House. Swapping out a toilet can be easy and can often be done with just one or two tools. If you do a lot of it, you actually use something like this, a turkey baster, which gets you right down to the bottom. Make sure it's not the same turkey baster you used for Thanksgiving. Oh. <laughs> and there used to be a swing set back here that killed all the grass. I'll make it green again. Can new technology allow us to live off the grid in an efficient way and still have all the comforts of a modern home? I'm headed to South Carolina to find out. When I think of off the grid houses though, I'm not thinking of this. I mean, this is grand, this is luxurious. How many square feet? There's 6,800 square feet. Wow. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House where if you've got questions about your house, we'd love to hear from you. So keep those emails coming. And we have gotten a ton of them on toilets. So Richard is actually going to show us how to install a toilet with all of the steps A through Z. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, Kevin. Ross, Richard, Hey, toilets. look at this thing, Kevin. Come on in here. Yeah. 100, 100 solar panels right here. Crazy. Cool. That is a whole self-contained cool. system. Cool. Richard, toilets A to Z installation. What? Toilets A to <laughs> am Z. I up, am I up first? You are up first. Well, okay. you and the toilet are up first. Well, you're going away. So yeah. You're going I'm on, on it. it. Okay. Right, I'll report back. Go on, right. Ross. See you guys. I didn't see the sheet. I didn't know I was up first. So I, I, I need five more minutes. You need I'm, some time with the toilet? I do. <laughs> I do. So Tommy's down the other end. Seriously? Uh, look, it's five, ten minutes. Tommy, Richard needs five minutes with this toilet, so I hope you're ready for the viewer tip. I'm gonna save him again. I guess so. All right, so this is actually a pretty good viewer's tip. I mean, think about it. If you're working in your workshop or in your garage, you're always trying to find out where you put your tape measure. This is true, it happens. You need to have a designated spot, okay? Right. All right, so Jamie from Tennessee sent, he says, with an electrical cover for a two-gang box, yep. a magnet, and some glue, take your tape measure, remove your belt clip, and glue the magnet to the side of the tape measure. So wherever the plate's mounted, your tape always has a home. Yeah, that is pretty clever. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking about it. I actually like the bell clip, so I don't think I would want to take that off. So I would probably take the, the magnet and glue it hmm. to the face of the tape measure. Yeah, yeah. That way I have the best of both worlds. That is pretty good too, okay. Well, Jamie, thank you for sending in that tip. And because of that, we are gonna send you an Ask This Old House t-shirt. And if anyone else out there has a tip for us, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email. Not bad. Not bad. Like think you give him enough time? He's What's sleeping that? down there. I don't think that's sleeping. Hey, Roger, thanks for coming. Well, it's really a nice spot you have here. How long have you been in the house? Just since November. Well, you survived the winter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but now that it's springtime, we want to get out here and start using the yard. Most of the yard was pretty nice, except for this huge muddy patch here. Yeah, what's this all about? So the people before us had a big swing set for their kids, but there's a public playground just a block and a half away. So we had them take the playground, and now we're left with this. <laughs> so as I look at it here, it looks like they took artificial turf and unrolled it on top of real turf. Yeah. Not a good idea. No. <laughs> And so we didn't want to just sprinkle seeds and, you know, have it wind up looking like a bad toupee. A bad toupee. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> well, there's a lot we can do here to fix this lawn and make it look really nice. I'm kind of excited because there is some good loam here to work with. We don't have to truck in a bunch of stuff. Great. But there are some humps and bumps in the backyard, and I'd like to try to smooth those out a little bit at the same time we're here. Great. First thing we've got to do is get this artificial turf out of here. Want to grab the other end? Perfect. Let me know when you're ready. One, two, three, go. The soil in here is really compact, so we're going to use this mini gas tiller to loosen it up. Well, it's really starting to look good. What a difference, yeah. huh? Now, even though we leveled it off as good as we could, we're still a little low in spots, so I want to add some material, but I'm not going to add just loam. I'm going to add compost to it. This is great stuff. I use it for everything I plant, perennials, vegetable gardens, and trees. It has micronutrients in there, and it really promotes growth in the plants, and it helps aerate the soil so it doesn't compact real hard like this did. Mm. All right, so I'm going to dump it, you spread it. You ready? You ready.
Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Once we have a layer of compost down, I'm gonna run the tiller over it again to mix it in with the existing soil. Why don't you come behind me and rake it out smooth? With our area all nice and smooth, we are ready to put down seed. Awesome. Now, when people think of a lawn, they think of it as one type of grass. It's really not. It's made up of three types here in New England, bluegrass, rye, and fescue. And the reason we do that, we use a blend, is if a disease ever got in your lawn, it would only kill out one type of seed, you'd still have some lawn left. If it was all one type, it could wipe out the whole thing. The other is, we have a lot of different environmental conditions here to deal with, one being sunlight. Bluegrass likes a lot of sun. Rye and fescue, they'll tolerate a little bit of shade. This is the cheapest part of the whole operation we've done today, so we're gonna make sure there's plenty of seed going in this lawn. Go all the way into the back. Okay. Now just work back and forth. See how it makes the seed disappear? Oh yeah. It's just getting a nice little layer of soil on top of it to help it germinate. If you okay. see any bumps or anything, just smooth them out. Now we're going to put down a starter fertilizer. The starter fertilizer is high in phosphorus and that promotes root growth. It also has 2%. That's a chemical that keeps crabgrass from germinating and overtaking our newly seeded lawn. So with our patch all set, we're going to do something called top dressing the lawn. We're going to take this compost and spread it on top of your lawn about a half an inch to an inch thick. Just take the rake and rake it right out. Yeah, front side of the rake? Yeah. Okay. And this is going to help us fill in any holes in the lawn, but it's also going to help the lawn grow. And this isn't smothering the lawn? Not at all. This is actually helping the lawn. In a week or two, you're going to come out here and you're going to be amazed at how green it looks. Excellent. Now we're going to put some seed down on the area that we just skimmed with compost. We don't need to put it down as heavy because it's not a new patch. We're just filling in some holes. And once the seed's raked in, we'll come by with the same starter fertilizer we used before. Now, the secret to getting this grass seed to pop is to keep it moist. You don't want to soak it down and turn it into mud. So you're probably going to come out here twice a day and water it a little bit each time. But with the spring rains we have now, yeah. you may not have to water. Mother Nature may help you with that. Great. Once it starts growing, it's going to pop up in seven to ten days. And you can see these little tiny pieces of grass coming up. Keep watering it for a while. When it gets to three inches tall, you're going to cut it back to two inches. Great. I can't wait to see it. Well, when it comes up, send me a picture. Will do. Roger, thank you so much for all your help. Hey. I said five minutes. Oh, now you're waiting on me. <laughs> I see. You're not prepared. All right, I'm ready now. Okay. Right. I thought we would talk about doing a pretty basic plumbing job, which is to replace a toilet. Which is, I think, something most people would want to avoid. They don't want to work around the toilet. So we thought maybe we'll do a little toilet 101. Generally, you might be able to get away with only one tool, an adjustable open wrench or some sort of pliers to break the connection. Okay. So first step is to get the water out of the toilet. So on the left-hand side, either out of the floor or the wall, there's a cold water supply. You're going to turn the shutoff valve clockwise. Sometimes it's just a quarter of a turn. Other times you have to turn it multiple times till it's off. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Now we've got to get the water out of the tank and bowl. Just take the cover off for me, okay? And this is the tank, that's yep. the bowl. Yep. Sometimes people get that confused. Right. So now we flush it. And the tank so is actually leave. draining into the bowl, right. bowl so, out. And you notice I'm holding this up. I want to get every bit of the water out of it that I can by gravity, but it's not going to let all of it out of the tank. There's always going to be some in the bottom. So for that, we've got to work another way. We can either use a small cup or a sponge. And this is perfectly clean water. People should not be afraid of right. this. Now, if you do a lot of it, you actually use something like this, a turkey baster, which gets you right down to the bottom, okay. simplifies it. 
Make sure it's not the same turkey baster you used for Thanksgiving. Oh, <laughs> so, ruined Thanksgiving. Oh, not, <laughs> so, all, all right. right, so tank is done. We're going to do the same thing at the bowl here. Okay, here you go. Because <laughs> that. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> you want the gloves? <laughs> is kind of clean water. Okay. Okay. So now we've got the water out of the tank in the bowl. Now we have to break a few more connections. One of them is the water connection. You can break the cold water supply right here. Sometimes it's pretty hand tight. Okay, a little bit of water, not too much. All right, so now we have two more connections, the closet bolts, which hold the toilet down to the flange. Now this is a brass connection, and hopefully it will come. Another one over here? Yeah, why don't you get that one? Thank you. Okay. Nut and washer off. Okay. Great. So now step right up here, and I'm going to show you the proper way to lift. Hook your hands right here, be straight back and straight up so it comes off the bolts, and then just step it back onto plywood or newspaper because it's got wax, old wax on the bottom. All right. Oh, lovely. Isn't that nice? That's just wax, so don't don't be freaked out. So now, oh, here. Oh, now you get me, right? <laughs> so, okay. okay. So just clean it up. You could wear gloves if you're doing this at home. This one's a clean one, yeah. uh, just because we're demoing it. It normally would be. Just around there. Okay, there you go. All right, so this is our closet flange. And it's really important that this flange is, is whole like it is right here, and also it, that it's attached down into the building itself. So you see the stainless screws here, mm -hmm. here, here, and here, yeah. down into the meat of the subfloor below the tile. Okay, so that'll hold the flange to the building. And then the other part of the connection is to make sure the toilet is held to the flange. So it's flange of building, toilet to flange. Right, so they make a special bolt right here called a closet bolt. And you'll see that it keys right in, right here, and you bring it to the center point right here, and these, li these little plastic holders will hold it at the right position. Put that one in, okay? Got Key it. it in. Okay, so those bolts are in place right there. So now we've got the flange attached to the building, the bolt's ready to go. Let's get this out of the way. And now we need to make a water and airtight seal to the bottom of the toilet. So this is now replacing the, ra the wax that's ring? That's right. This has been the time-honored wax seal that sits right down here. Mm -hmm. This is one that I, I tend to favor, which is a little thicker, but also has a horn to direct the water down away from where that uh, top connection is. All right, so now let's put this back in position. This can be the hardest part of the show sometimes. Now push it down. Wiggle, right, so wiggle, now push it's it down. Sitting on the ring and I just kind push of your weight it. down, push your weight down, and it'll make that nice tight seal. You can actually feel it. So we want to cover these bolts when we're done. So the manufacturer makes a bolt cap, and this is the base. So that goes on first. Then there's a bronze washer that's plated, and that goes right over the top. Okay. And once you put that nut on right there, We're going to tighten a little bit from each side and bring it down uniformly down under that wax seal. We don't want to over tighten on one side and then crack the toilet potentially. Okay, one more snug. There. All right, so now they make these stand proud because they don't know how deep below it the flange will be. So look what happens, it's just too tall. So these bolts are made that you could snap them off. You see there's a little ridge right there. But this is the best way to get it off. And so you just cut. What you want to do is be careful not to let the blade, the hacksaw blade or this little jab saw, scratch the vitreous china. So this is a soft brass material, so I can actually just. OK, nice. so now pop the cap on. Push it down, straight down from the top, and it should snap. There you go. Yep. All right, toilet secure. Now we can remake the water connection. Let's snug it up. Okay, let's turn it back on. Okay. And there she is, filling up. Why don't you grab the tank cover? Okay. All right, so this was important to know if you ever were changing out a new toilet for the old one or if you had a symptom of a leak from below the toilet mint and the wax seal was gone. Beautiful. Well, you know what, Richard? It was worth the wait. <laughs>
As recently as 150 years ago, practically every house in America was off the grid. This is how you got your water. Mm. This was your sewer. And where's your lighting and heating coming from? You're looking at it. Modern houses like these are connected to a variety of systems. There are pipes that carry gas and water into the house. And there's also a pipe that carries waste out of the house to the sewer line here in the street. And these houses are wired to the local electric company, to the cable provider, and to the phone company. Can new technology allow us to live off the grid in an efficient way and still have all the comforts of a modern home? Well, I'm headed to South Carolina to find out. Good morning, Ross. Good morning, Ralph. Welcome to our home in Pickens, South Carolina. What a beautiful place, what a beautiful house. Thank you. When I think of off-the-grid houses, though, I'm not thinking of this. I mean, this is grand, this is luxurious. How many square feet? There's 6,800 square feet. Wow. This house was built 15 years ago. This house has always been off the grid as far as water and sewer, but now my wife and I have decided to take it completely off the grid. Now, I've been in the air conditioning business for 50 years. There's technologies available commercially that will allow us to do that. Gotcha. So you're taking commercial technologies, applying it to a residential house. This is not off the grid yet. You guys are transitioning. We're transitioning. We're about halfway through right now. Got it. Well, I'd love to see the technology. Can we check it out? I would love for you to see it. All right, let's go. <laughs> so how is Ralph moving this 6,800 square foot house completely off the grid? For starters, he's getting his electricity from renewable sources. When it's completed, this solar array will have 144 photovoltaic panels and provide 40 kilowatts of power. A wind turbine will generate electricity at night or on cloudy days. A battery bank will store unused power for lighting and appliances. But the solar array also powers these chillers, which as a system are more efficient to run than a conventional air conditioning unit. But think of the insanity of how that equipment operates, okay? It takes heat from your house and then exhausts it outside, okay? And, and, and it's wasted. What we were able to do is to capture that heat. We, we uh, pull the heat from the house and we put it into a tank for hot water, make it available for the household hot water, for the swimming pool, for whatever you'd like to have. And also in the winter, we're able to pull heat out of the air, even as low as 20 below zero, and move it into the structure or into a storage tank. And then the magic of this, I assume, is that you're not making heat, you're moving heat? We're moving heat. And where do you store that heat? Well, we have some tanks I'd like to show you. All right, love that. Ross, this is where the hot and cold glycol come up, okay? Uh, these tanks are actually buried about four feet in the ground, and I've got one open over here for you to take a look at. Okay. okay. What's inside these tanks okay. is, is hundreds of feet of polytubing or PEX, okay? Mm -hmm. This tank is normally filled with water and we use it to store heat. We'll bring the excess heat or any heat that's produced with the PV through the chiller, mm -hmm. we'll bring it in here and we'll store a tank of hot water. So essentially what we have here is a thermal battery. Rather than a battery that stores electrons, we have a battery that's storing BTUs. And what, what are you gonna use that hot water for? Uh, for, ha for comfort heating. Okay, for our household hot water or swimming, heat, whatever, anything you want to use the hot water for. Got it, got it. Okay. But you're also doing this with the cold tank, right? That's correct. What we do with the cold tank is the cold glycol comes in, goes through the tubes, and we'll make a 500 pound block ice. Really? Inside, that's right. We'll use that tank at night for, to keep the house cool. So even when the sun's not shining, you're not running your equipment, you're a chiller. It's completely and off. you have a block of ice to pull all that cooling energy from. Absolutely. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. Well, Ralph, I love to hear the fact that you're going off grid. One of the things that's surprising to me is that the technology you're using here today is actually old technology. It's been used for 30 years in commercial buildings. So why has it been a slow adoption for residential use? Well, commercial and residential has always been built differently. Okay, Commercial rates are uh, rates that have peak and time of use components. Okay? okay, There are times of day where businesses or commercial applications pay more for their power than they do at others. And it could affect their, their power structure for the whole month. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. And so what commercial has been done for a long, long time is they've used ice storage. They make ice at night, and then during the day, during the peak demand hours, they'll melt the ice to keep the buildings cold rather than run the compressors. 
Got it. So you're saying because they're storing this ice during off-peak hours yes. when they're not paying as much for electricity, they can actually use that ice storage to then recool the building during the next day when they don't have to run the chillers or the compressors. That's correct. Uh, these same time of use charges, these peak charges are coming to residential applications. Got it. And the really cool benefit of this is that because you're being able to store energy, you actually can offset how much, how many more power plants go up and the peak charge on the grid. Yes, you can avoid building any new power plants. You go to distribute what's called distributed energy, yep. okay? And you, you put photovoltaic out or fuel cells all over, okay? Mm -hmm. And you avoid any new power plants. You work with what you've got because what we've got is plenty to yeah. go forward if it's used wisely. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Ralph, for the tour. I'd Pleasure, love to see Ross. Used. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. Right. Wow, the future is bright. Ah, <laughs> 6,800 square feet, a pool, a farm. That is seriously over the top. There's a lot going on there. That's true. But you think about the traditional house in America that has cooling, right? Yeah. You have an outdoor unit, a condenser, and you have an indoor unit, right? And you have a set of refrigeration lines between the two, mm -hmm. right? That's cooling the house. You're actually moving heat from inside to outside, rejecting it to the air. Okay. The difference here is that we're using a chiller. Yeah, so what, what exactly is the difference between a chiller and an air conditioner? Yeah, so the chiller is gonna heat and cool water, right? Or glycol. So instead of refrigeration lines moving between the house yeah. and the outside unit, we have water lines. And so I can create a hot tank, I can create a cold tank, so that I can do simultaneous heating and cooling, I can store it, mm. you know, for later use. And, and you get the storage because of the liquid. In other words, he had a tank that was ice. You can only have that with a liquid. That's how he's storing cold. That's right. I and mean, he's got another tank where he heats the water. That's right. storing the heat. The key point is the water. I yeah. can store that energy and I can use it at later points in time. Right. right. Okay. And water is the ultimate transfer medium. Nothing, nothing's better. You know, this, this thing ties into the dream that I've had for a long time in this country. The big house and the yeah. pool? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, actually a scalable and really usable BTU battery. You know, not everybody's going to have that kind of land where you can bury tanks outside. Right. So I, the idea is to have a super insulated tank that would have handles on it. You could get it in through a building, through a doorway. It would have a heat exchanger coil inside it. Yeah. And it would be modular. You could tie them together, tie them together like you would batteries. And then all of a sudden, the, when you're making heat, you can just store it. And then all of a sudden, once you've stored energy in this tank or these series of tanks, you can come out of it and go out to make hot water for right. your faucets, heat the building with a little bit of radiant and stuff like that. And it's really the future. We've got to find a way to keep moving heat, not trying to make heat. Right. Well, I mean, it is cool to see this future, yeah. to think that something like that could be possible. Is that a day. pun? Cool. <laughs> and, and scale down, too, to make yeah. it sort of you know, affordable for most Absolutely. people. All right. Well, good story. Thank you for bringing it to us. If you've got questions, we'd love to answer them. So keep your emails coming. Until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Rich Trithui. I'm Ross Trithui for Ask This Old House. I'm surrounded by Trithui. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Get, Get away from me. Next time on Ask This Old House. Swapping out a radiator isn't too difficult, but there are some tricks to getting it exactly right. Okay, that should do it. If you work outside, there's one piece of safety gear you need to have in your toolbox, and I'll show you why it's important. I noticed that there are some cracks in the mortar and some of it's missing entirely. Three-pointing brick can be easy. I'm going to Milwaukee to show you how to do it. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.